Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? If you can, it's courtesy of Ronan here, who's um, taking great care that uh, everything we do tonight is visible and audible. Um, and I must say, it, it is actually very clear sound. That's so well done, Ronan. Um, thank you for your nice introduction. And I think the only thing I would have put in my own introduction, uh, particularly to this group, is that I suppose I've been speaking to AWARE for a very long time. I don't know if any of you go back that far, but I've certainly, yeah, good. So I've been speaking for a long time, haven't I? You know, over the years. And I have to say, when I come to AWARE, it always feels like coming home. It feels like something um, very familiar and very warm, and uh, I look forward to these talks. I haven't always been in the country. I was in the States for a while, so I missed a few years. But um, going back to the 80s, I think uh, I've been kind of coming in here. Um, and I, I suppose normally when I've spoken, I've spoken about depression. I've spoken about... Um, you know, therapies or something to do with uh, mindfulness or something like that. And tonight is a, a different topic for me. And um, uh, but I, I, it's where my life has taken me. You know, I'm working now with young people, 12 to 25, and I want to tell you a bit about that. Why I made that choice. I had worked in James's Patrick's for 25 years, and I was working uh, in adult uh, psychiatry. So my work was with adults. Uh, and then I left, and I set up Headstrong, which is to work with young people. <coughs> Why did I do that? I think because when I looked back on the time I had in James's, I think that there was all kinds of reasons why people would end up in James's um, or come there for help. Um, but the two words that I heard probably most frequently from people were, if only, if only, if only I had been able to speak to somebody when I was 14 about this. If only I had had help. Uh, if only I'd been listened to when I was young and that was happening to me. Um, it may not have grown into quite the problem it's become. Because I think very often what it starts as a crisis can grow legs and it can become a reason to withdraw from life, a reason to look to alcohol and drugs for pain relief or self-harm. And it, it, can, it can become compounded. And I suppose the question for me was, if you could actually reach young people, or any of us, you know, when we're young, people, um, could you actually maybe help people to deal with something rather than to spend the next 10, 20 years running away? Um, and I suppose that was the question. I suppose that... Um, I've been trying to answer for the last eight, ten years almost. I left in, I left really in 2004, but I set up Headstrong in, in 2006. Um, and I, I want to talk about that, what I've learned about youth mental health, what's happening with young people, why they're finding it so tough at times, uh, what they need, what seems to work for them, um, talk about what I have been doing with a, a number of people around the country in trying to support young people and give you some really, I think, exciting data on the impact of that because we've just now begun to get back data on the what is the actual benefit, what happens when you reach a very, very distressed young person and you are able to engage with them in the right way, in the right place, and... Uh, I suppose, give them the support they need. What happens? What happens in their life? And we're beginning to get back that data, and it's, it's really very exciting. So I want to come to that and tell you that story. But the real story is, you know, um, you know we, were, we all went through adolescence. I mean, if you have been adolescent in your life, probably all of you, um, and if you remember it, it's not an easy time. Um, it's a time full of questions. Um, it's a time when you wake up and you're a girl but not quite a woman, but you're no longer a child. You're a boy but no longer a man, but you're no longer a child. And you're in that in-between and your eyes are opened and you see the world around you as being pretty messed up. And the adults that you may have thought were perfect, teachers, uncles, parents, are actually far from perfect. In fact, very often it's like waking up and realizing the emperor has no clothes. And you're disappointed 
and yet you need these people because they're important. So you're caught in trying to struggle with them on the one hand because you're so frustrated with the way they do things. I mean, they don't get life. I mean, let's face it, parents just worry about the most inane things, you know, water charges and mortgages. And you're meanwhile dealing with this intense life inside. And it is, nobody gets it. And nobody realizes what you're going through. They're so dumb, you know, and, and you get frustrated with them. And yet you also desperately need them not to give up on you to hang in and to give you cups of tea or at least tolerate your roving around the house with your music playing in your ears. So you're caught. It's all that kind of, and, and, and there's the wild changes in the body that push you into all kinds of new territory altogether, which is not easy to cope with. Um, and then you sort of add into this that there's someone at school has died of suicide, um, that you've got a teacher who's really picking on you or you've got an older student who's picking on you or you've got somebody who's, who's very inappropriate in some other way. And you've all that going on, but you don't understand what it's about. Maybe you deserve it. Maybe this is what you deserve. Um, and so you're confused, and you can't say it. And you've got all that inside, and you have no words to say it. And where do you, what do you do with that? And all of that can kind of grow legs. It can get, you know, it can, it can become complicated. Um, and I suppose that's, that's the moment where we pick up uh, in our life. Uh, um, and there is something particularly uh, intense about adolescence. This is uh, like a chart flowing through life of all the uh, various um, diseases and disorders that beset human beings over the course of their life. If you look over to the right side of the stage, you can see a menu of things you can look forward to when you're 80. Um, you can have a choice between neurological sense disorders, um, some of you might prefer cardiovascular cancer, and actually you'll notice that the mental health difficulties diminish quite radically at that time of life. But if you pull back your attention here to the 10 to 30, you see that mental disorders, and again that's very crude language, so we're, we're not even saying we know what they are, but it, 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 there is some evidence of mental distress uh, that's severe enough to warrant intervention or help of some kind. But, you know, it is, it's escalating. So there's something exquisitely sensitive about that 10 to 20, 10 to 25. And um, now, I get you to think about something. When you think about the services we have, what services are in Ireland? We have child services, right? We've had old services. But if you like... We're, we got fairly good child services, fairly good adult services, but we have a dip in the middle. So the system is weakest where it needs to be strongest, where the need is greatest, where there's, there's nobody there. And if you're a parent with a 15, 16 year old who's going through a bad time, you know this. You know how you tear your hair out trying to, um, trying to find somewhere to send them for help. It's not easy. and you, you suffer with them. Remember, you're as happy as your least happy child. So if you have four kids and one of them's not doing well, that's where you're stuck. That's where your attention is, right? Um, so, um, you know what Robert Williams said about parenting teenagers? He said, it's like being a cocaine addict. He says, you never sleep and you're paranoid all the time. Um, um, so, uh, so we, um, in, uh, so, well, w w what I wanted to do was to say, okay, what would actually work? Well, first thing was, I'd worked in adult psychiatry, so I was going to have to figure out what was going on with young people. It's kind of a cheek to leave an adult psychiatry service, you know, we are psychologists for adults, and set up what became the National Centre for Youth Mental Health. I just thought of that title and I put it there. And nobody said you shouldn't, and a few years later I was speaking to the parliamentary party in Fianna Fáil, and I said to Tom Kidd, I never actually got permission to use this. He said, well, they don't know that. So um, that's fine. Um, but really the question for me, the, the issue here is that I didn't know what it was like being 16 in 2006. Um, I'd had children, but, you know, I didn't know what it was like now. And I think what I learned is that sometimes we think ignorance is a bad thing, but sometimes what you don't know is your greatest strength. It's actually powerful. It's a faculty of intelligence. Because when you don't know something, now the important thing is to know you don't know, but when you don't know something, you start to ask really good questions. 
but never be afraid not to know something, because that can lead to a really great question. So we began to ask in headstrong questions of young people, and we, uh, we created a very sophisticated questionnaire. It was actually 20 questionnaires, um, and we gave it to 18,000 young people, got complete data on 14,300. Uh, 1.5 million data points. And with that amount of information, we were the biggest national database in youth mental health in the world. And nobody's got that sophisticated. When you have that data, it's like having weather patterns. You can then ask it questions. You can say, well, look, this is what we have. And the questions we asked um, were, you know, sorry, this is our study. Um, we did it in conjunction with UCD. Um, for virtually no money. We got 22 people who were doing theses and MAs to help, and they all got something out of it, but it would have cost hundreds of thousands. It didn't cost nearly that much. Um, we found that, you know, approximately one in three. Um, we found roughly, I think, you know, 60, 70% were doing okay of our young people. Um, again, remember, this is 12 to 25. Uh, but one in three had mild to severe um, anxiety and depression. About 10%, I'd say, were up in the severe end. That's one in ten, and that's a lot feeling very, very depressed. Um, one in four uh, had uh, severe stress. Um, very often young people experience problems not in a, in a very developed sense. They don't say to you, my self-esteem is low, I'm struggling with a low mood, I'm not sleeping very well. No, they just say, <coughs> they just feel stressed and they feel frustrated and it's, it's, it's somatic, you know, it's, it's bodily, it's physical. Um, and I think that about 10% of adolescents and 20% of young adults did not seek help. Um, this was the most... We asked the data, who were the kids most at risk? And the, the kids who were most at risk were those who knew there was something wrong but weren't seeking any help. And those were the ones that were suffering the most. And when you looked at them over time, they got worse. Okay? The data would suggest that they were on a... They were on a, on a road to nowhere, and so it was really important. And that we found that when people did seek help, no matter what kind of help they sought, they seemed to kind of turn a corner, and the data began to turn in a different direction. They started to get well. Um, asking people what, you know, mental health and what it means to them, sometimes you get different ways of communicating data. We've a lot of qualitative data in that study. Um, I think you can see it, being left behind when everybody's progressing through adolescence, having no sense of direction or having some sense of direction and what that feels like. Um, having a sense of direction, you feel empowered, you know, um, and uh, without it, you feel lost, um, very needy, in pain, on drugs, mm, or on, is that drugs? Um, substance abuse, very dark. Um, so, you know, that sense of being lost and losing your way, um, that's a, a very painful place to be in. And I love this one because it was a 16-year-old who did it, he even wrote his name. Uh, I doubt you'd know him. Um, but he, um, he wrote his name, but he... What I, really strikes me about this is that if you take away all the writing and all of the things, you'd see a very cool-looking guy, probably a slightly intimidating-looking guy. Somebody across the road, if he passed, if he walked towards you, he might just cross the road. And he looks so cool and so together and so on top of things. But Killian uh, clearly has a lot going on in his head. Um, I think this is very important. You don't know. You know it's, easy, it's tempting to say young people have it better than ever, you know. They have so much going for them. And my God, in my day, we had nothing like that. And you can read their behavior as being carefree and fantastic. I guess I've been around a lot of young people in the last, uh, you know, nine, ten years, and um, I've realized that those that can sometimes look like the most gifted and the most um, uh, energized and just like they're having a ball with life, I never had it that good, are actually not having a ball with life, and they're actually suffering behind that uh, in quite dramatic ways. So it's the first thing that you've got to realize is we don't know what's going on, okay? Um, uh, one of our young people, Sarah, who looked like she had everything going for her, wonderfully bright, intelligent in college, uh, wrote an article in the Times, and she talked. She said that she talked about the thousands and thousands of teenagers who are somehow managing to live their lives while secretly disintegrating, um, or losing their way. Um, and she used that great phrase: "They they they keep on um, keeping on, wondering if it's only at the edge." So we have. 
a great deal of talk about suicide, a great deal of talk that's important about, you know, how horrible it is and how dreadful it is, and we all get very upset. But I guess her feeling was that it's only when that happens that we begin to look and say, what is happening in the lives of young people? And could we not maybe have got to them a little sooner? Or do we have to wait until they fall off that cliff? Um, but what's going on? Why is it so hard, you know? Um, I think that one of the reasons it's hard is that when is a child, children growing up, they have certain, like they have an unconscious, but they have certain concerns and themes in their life. And what is the theme of every child's life underneath in all the fairy stories? The thing they worry about and they can't articulate, but they love reading stories about it and they read them over and over and over and over again? Death. It's a big theme with children. And they like to know that the princess lives in the end or she's kissed and comes alive. And, you know, these are very, very important. Now, adolescence, different story. What's the theme in adolescence? It's not death. Murder. Okay? Adolescence has, an adolescent, in order to grow, has to accommodate within themselves a kind of a push, an aggressiveness. Development needs aggressiveness. And we, we kind of don't like to talk about that. We want them to become just a more and more loving person. If an adolescent finds themselves, they're going to find peace, not just with the sides of themselves they label loving, but with the sides of themselves that we label destructive, that are aggressive. And every adolescent, you know that, uh, comes into this. My son was the most meek and mild, gentle soul in the world. He took in windsurfing. I'd take him out into Dublin Bay. He'd disappear in Gale Force 9 out into the uh, bay. And I would hear back, standing there in Sandy Mount, I would just hear this roaring, and there was language in the roaring I'd never heard before and that he never learned at home at the dinner table. There was Fs and blind and, and this and that. And I said, oh, my God. Is he on his own out there? No, he said, it must be somebody else. And then, of course, he was on his own. Then he'd come back in. I'd say, hi, you OK? Yeah. How was that? Oh, great, fine. And he'd go home. Now, the point is, that's where he had, he gave some space to those kind of impulses. Um, sport, very, very important. And, but, you know, but, you know, bullies, very often, looking for an outlet for all of that, not ideal. But sometimes we need to know that that's what they're struggling with. You know, the, the job of every adolescent is to take over the role of the adults and to take their place in the world as leaders. That needs a little bit of, you know, the zoom, you know, you got it's not just loving kindness that gets you there. You got a little bit, you know, and, and they have to learn to temper that and tame that and work with that. But that's what's going on. And I think every adolescent has that. And it's not that they've turned into monsters. It's just that they've, they've kind of grown. They are growing a personality. OK, um, so a couple of things about adolescents that I think are important. Um, uh, one is it takes time. There is no cure for adolescence except the passage of time. Uh, and the, you I need to say that to yourselves and to every parent you know who's struggling. This takes time, okay? Growth takes time. You can't hurry love and you can't hurry adolescent development. It takes time. The main job for you as parent or adult or carer is to hang in with them over that time. What you do, 80% of love is hanging in and not giving up and not... Um, shaming them for the way they behave, um, but actually holding your ground, holding yourself steady, and just uh, giving a, a little bit of leeway, a little bit of a deaf ear to some of what you, what, you have to, what you see and put up with, as well as listening. In certain environments, young people can only survive by adapting a false self. And this is the world that we've created for them, that we insist that they be nice all the time, and so the murderous feelings or the loneliness they feel or the anxiety or stress they feel has to be buried. Uh, we don't want to know that, okay? I'm not saying you personally, but generally as a society, we prefer not to know about that. So we ask them to kind of adopt a false, smiling self. And of course, Facebook encourages that because everybody out there the same age as them look and sound and, and feel, they claim, cool all the time. But of course they don't. But anyway, so, but to a young person committed to integrity, um, you know, being false is exhausting. And, and because in every young person, there is um, something that they all want, which is to feel real. And that's why they like things that are real. That's why they can often take difficulties in a family or a death or something that we don't want to talk about. But when you do talk about it, 
suddenly the atmosphere becomes real. People are talking honestly and a young person generally can cope with that better than the adults um, because they're longing for that kind of realness. The music they like feels real. The movies they like feels more real. They're, you know, the, the conversations they like, the uncle, the aunt, it's generally the one that was in the Rutland or went away to, took the boat to London with a little problem. Um, and, but they feel real because they've suffered and they're the people that become very important in their life. And they, can, they have radar for what feels real and it's an important thing. Um, here's one of our young people. Um, uh, when I set up Headstrong, I had the <laughs> wisdom to know that I knew nothing much about adolescence. Um, as I say, that is a faculty of intelligence, to know what you don't know. So I got some young people around me, um, as one of them here tonight, and I um, it basically said to them, you know, what's happening? What's, what's, what, what's mental health? And what's happening in your life? And here's what I was thinking of doing. Is that, would that work? Or what do you need? You know, and started listening. And um, Tim was one of the first one, and he came up with a... Um, that time he went to Fianna Fáil Parliamentary Party... Um, uh, this was the, 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 the definition of youth mental health he gave them. And again, he's 17 when he wrote this. Uh, if youth is a journey, then youth mental health is a feeling that the road ahead is clear, that you can negotiate whatever obstacles arise. You're on the way towards a definite destination. That destination may change an awful lot, but you know you're going somewhere. You're going somewhere. That feeling, okay? Um, young people need to have some sense of themselves, uh, some sense that they belong, that they fit in, and there's some sense that they've got something to do with their lives. They're going somewhere. Going somewhere might be collecting stamps. It might be playing for the school team. It might be trying to get, uh, 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 you know, a brown belt and kickboxing. It doesn't matter, but there's something that's drawing them on that matters and means something to them. Um, young people nowadays, because we know they're important activities, they're generally expected to do all three of those things on top of school and on top of half a dozen. They're timetable to death, and we need to give them room to just hang out too. Um, there was a study. Uh, people sometimes think about suicide and why young people take their lives. Um, I think one of the, the casual reasons we might say is, well, they all feel hopeless. And that was certainly the thinking in, in Scotland, in Edinburgh, um, when they began to study a group of young people who were repeat suicide um, attempters. And uh, Andrew McLeod had the idea, well, you know, they obviously have nothing to live for, okay? And he said, so I'll just, you know, really prove this, because then, you know, the research was fairly early. And so he asked a whole lot of young people uh, who had been, well, they were around 21, 22, um, uh, you know, what... Uh, do you feel, you know, what are your dreams or what, what kind of would be important or what would, you know, what would keep you alive sort of thing? What, what's, you know, what, what might be in the future for you? And he then asked a lot of young people who were in college, had not had depression, not had any problems with suicidal behaviour. He asked them the same question. His thesis, his hypothesis was that he would find, of course, that the young people with, who had suicide had far less to look forward to than the other crowd. That seems like intuitively... Incredible, right? He found completely the opposite. Uh, no, not quite the opposite. He, did, he found completely the opposite to what he expected because what he found was that there was no difference, no difference at all between the number of dreams and hopes that the suicidal group had to the non-suicidal group. Okay? But there was a difference between the two groups. What was it? In the non-suicidal group, they had the confidence that they could go somewhere that they could get somewhere. They had the belief that they could get from here to there, whatever there was. Um, in the suicidal group, they had the dream, but they had no confidence they could ever achieve it. And to me, that was a very poignant insight into the human heart. Um, to have a dream and to feel you can never get there is, is actually far more painful than having no dream, right? You get that? Um, so it's very important they know. Um, when we looked at our data, um, uh, we asked our data another question. You know, when you have all these data, you say to the question, you know, what is it that seems to matter? What helps people to get through bad times, young people? Um, and the data, all the engines, you know, and that outspews the answer. And the answer was that the most, 
the, the strongest predictor of people surviving um, difficulty or distress and people being able to grow through that experience rather than just be oppressed and destroyed by it was the availability in their life of at least one good adult who knew them personally and who believed in them. One good adult, okay? And uh, so what we found was that the presence of one good adult was a key predictor of how well a young person uh, became connected, self-confident, um, looking forward and, and, and able to cope with problems. So kind of, you know, there's a general outlook and a confidence that we were talking about in the Andrew McLeod study. Uh, the absence, however, uh, was linked to higher levels of distress, antisocial behaviour, increased risk of suicidal behaviour. So one good adult, okay? Now, you've probably had one good adult, and I would suggest you would not be here had you not had in your life somewhere a number of adults, but I'm saying one good adult. Now that, we think, of course, well, that might be me mammy, I mean, daddy. I, I was working with the rugby team uh, some time ago and Brian O'Driscoll shot up his hand. I asked him, who was your one good daddy? Me ma'am. Oh, should be Amy or what's her name? The, yeah. No, it's me ma'am. Um, and his ma'am is incredible. Uh, and that was his good adult. Um, uh, but it sometimes is not your mum, okay? It sometimes can be uh, the teacher, um, you can remember maybe a teacher who, was, uh, who believed in you when you didn't believe in yourself, who felt you had something you could go for. Um, or it could be the lollipop lady who just, you know, it's every morning you walked up and you got out of the car or you got out off the bus and you were feeling crap because there was fights going on at home. And the way she looked at you, you know, how are you? You suddenly saw you were a human being in her eyes with some good in you even though you didn't think it. And you get that morning after morning and that holds you. Um, or it could be the sports coach, um, which could be terribly important. Somebody who says, come on now, okay, I know you can do better, and who draws out of you. A, a good adult isn't somebody saying, oh, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Now, a good adult is someone who, who sees what you can, loves you for who you are, but sees what, loves also what you can become. Um, and so... I want you just, all of you, just for a moment, you can do this without uh, moving, actually, uh, just to think back to when you were 12 and 18, and just think for a moment, um, was there anybody that was important? Doesn't matter who it was, that was important, that was both, and this is the key, who believed in you, you know, they kind of knew you personally, but, and was available to you, you know? Somebody you could just talk to. When I started working with young people, I had this great idea and I went to them and I said, okay, here's the thing now. I got this mission statement. You have to have a mission statement when you set up an organisation. And my mission statement was that Headstrong's role was to support... No, Headstrong's role was to help young people in their journey into adulthood. Does that sound good? Sounds great. I thought it was great, actually. I thought it was Nobel Prize worthy, at least. I was talking to about 10 young people and I noticed their faces didn't move. In fact, they kind of seemed incredibly unimpressed. And I said, what's wrong? And they said, uh, we don't like it. And I said, what's wrong? And they said, we don't want to be helped. We want to be heard. And that's like really important that we begin to listen to what they're saying um, and one of the ways that we listen, of course, is to give them platforms where they can say things. And this was a film competition. There's a lot of them happening around now. Is that cast who had a big film competition recently in, in, in um, City, oh, the Red Cow? But um, this is one where um, Reach Out, uh, the website, had a, a competition. And I just really like it. And it just gives you a sense of, just think about these... 15, 16, 17-year-olds who are making a movie themselves without adults telling them how to do it and submitting it to a competition. Have a look at this. Our mind is key to running our entire body. Moving, thinking, feeling, living. Yes, many of us take our mental health for granted, believing that we don't need to handle our own mental health to live mentally well. But as many as one in four of us will experience some kind of mental health problem in the course of a year. Causes can vary from 
relationship issues to loss and grief, bullying to sexual identity, and from anxiety to depression. If we choose not to face and deal with our issues, small issues can grow large and big issues can become too hard to handle by yourself. With any issue, we can feel self-conscious about ourselves and that we don't want others to see it. So we can hide ourselves away, allowing our problems to take root. Burying ourselves into an environment of isolation, loneliness and hurt. You are not alone though. There are many of us who are like you. There are people who were, and there are people who will be. But there are many people out there who want to help you. Good mental health is not about having no mental health problems, but it's how we react and cope with difficult situations while maintaining a positive outlook on life. If you feel you need a helping hand, there are plenty of us there to reach out to. So, um, you know, what can these young people do? I mean, what do they know? Well, actually, I've never seen a, as good a presentation on mental health by adults, but that's another point. Um, I think they have a lot, and when we listen and give them uh, places to speak, I think we learn a lot. Um, so this is broadly the thing that, you know, when people, this is another finding we had, when people look for help, um, generally the, that movement of looking, and that's a big step, uh, actually activates some kind of um, recovery potential within the person, okay? Um, the question, of course, is, um, you know, where do you go if you're in trouble? Well, thankfully, there's no end of options. That was a joke. Um, okay, um, so where do you go? Well, it's a little bit like this. Um, you know, it's, there's so many places you're meant to go, but here's the thing, it's, it's actually not very clear. Um, and when you get there, clinics or that, they, they tend to be rather well designed as inconvenient stores rather than convenient stores. So that everything is just like a little bit out of reach. Um, you have to be precisely troubled, you have to be troubled in a very precise way to qualify for entrance to these special places. And if you're even a little bit out, they'll tend to ignore you. Um, I love this cartoon, do you get this? Wait, wait, cancel that, I guess it says help. So, you know, it's not quite perfect. The presentation doesn't fit the bill, therefore, no, we can't help him or her. Um, and then when they get in, what happens? They get labelled um, very quickly. Um, you've got bipolar, you've got depression. Um, and like before somebody has a chance to say what's happening, it happens very quickly. And these labels come with super glue. They're stuck on the, um, the, the thing and they're there forever. Now here's the thing, when that jam is all used up, and then you start using the uh, jar for coffee beans. Um, the label still says the same thing, but you're now using it for coffee beans. Or you might finish with the coffee beans and you might use it to collect, um, I don't know, uh, old Dart uh, or Lewis uh, tickets. I mean, you never know, you might have a particular thing for Lewis tickets. But that's not what's in the label says the label. And I think the danger with labeling is that people can outgrow, uh, particularly because they're very plastic as young people they're developing and changing they can outgrow distress and particular symptoms of anxiety or depression but the label can sometimes stick so we have to be awfully careful about being putting labels and yet one of the only ways that they will get treatment is by having first of all a label so you know that's a problem so we thought well um the idea of headstrong and jigsaw which is ours i'm going to talk about now is uh, captured by this sign. Do you know what this means? Can anybody guess? A stitch in time saves nine. Exactly. So if we can get to the problem before it goes nuclear, um, maybe we could do something. So we began to, to kind of work with young people across Ireland to design um, a, a kind of systems of care to look at what was there for them and then to begin to create um, pathways to all kinds of options of care and to make, if you like, create an invisible support system with a lot of menu, but to create a very accessible, visible hub or, if you like, you know, uh, a portal, okay? So this is like a, the portal uh, we call Jigsaw in Donegal. 
And the idea here is that it's on the main street. You can walk in and um, inside there you get direct help, but also uh, you're, you're pointed to a whole menu of supports depending on your level of need. Okay. This is in Mead, although yesterday in Mead, now we got this most amazing building, uh, which is just a new building because we got too, too cramped in that one. But you can see it's on the main street, it's fine. These are free, confidential services, fully staffed with clinicians who are trained, um, knit into HSC services and so on. But there are, if you like, pathways that you can go very quickly and get the help you need. Um, as you can see, there is one-to-one -one support, um, signposting, advice for parents and others, um, and, you know, it's not long ago that, you know, a service uh, clinic might have looked like this. This is what we had. Um, and now you're talking about something that looks like this. Uh, I don't need to tell you that IKEA came on board and sponsored uh, all of our, you know, so they're all furnished free by IKEA. You take what you get. Um, now, the other thing is that we have 10 jigsaws around the country, but we have, um, uh, and they're quite, quite, complex services, they have lots of elements to them, so I'm not going to go into all those, but uh, we've asked each, each of the young, the, each one has a group of young people at the heart of it, and we've asked each of them, and each of them has developed a tour for their peers. So online they can show you, so if you're living in Donegal and you're out there in, in, in Ishone or you're in the Glenties or somewhere, you might want to go to talk to that, you heard about this jigsaw Donegal in Letterkenny, but you might want to go there, but you might be nervous about it, and you might have ideas that it's going to be something it's not, and so you might like to look it up. And when you look it up, this is what you'll see. Stressing about school, exams, college. Sexuality. Work, money. Arguing with friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, parent, brother, sister. Feeling. Isolated, lonely, anxious, tense, can't sleep. If you find you are struggling and would like this to change, Jigsaw is a free and confidential support service for young people aged between 15 to 25 in County Donegal. We support young people and promote positive mental health. You will find someone here who you can talk to about whatever is bothering you. When you come to Jigsaw, you will be welcomed by a staff member and offered some tea or coffee while we inform the support worker that you are here. Your support worker will take you through to one of our session rooms. Here you can talk about what's on your mind and the support worker can find out what's important to you. You will work together to identify your personal goals. The service offers up to eight sessions. Life is full of challenges and Jigsaw supports young people to deal with the demands of their everyday lives and finding ways to cope that suit you. Jigsaw is about listening to and supporting young people, about building on young people's strengths, about valuing and respecting young people and about changing how Donegal thinks about young people's mental health. If you would like to find out more about Jigsaw, you can look us up on our website or you can phone us. This film was created by the Youth Advisory Panel to introduce you to Jigsaw Donegal. The app is a group of 16 to 25 year olds whose role is to voice their opinions and advise staff and management on how to improve the service. So we, um, we're getting, we're kind of the last leg of this talk now, I'd like to ask some questions, but we're getting to... Um, one of the things we realised very early on, if you want to create something new, it's not enough to build it. You've got to actually be able to tell the story. And the way you tell the story in mental health, if you're trying to change the way we do business, is to collect data, you know, to be able to say, this is what we do. So we've been collecting data in real time. We have a very sophisticated data management system across 10 sites I can tune in, which I did a little bit earlier. Uh, this is not that. Uh, the, I have a more recent one up to... Um, yeah, last Monday. Um, but uh, we have, uh, on our website, you can access these, you can see how many people we've seen. And this is since 2008, and you can see it's rising. 
Um, and you can see information about what happens to them. Uh, some of them have you know, one or two sessions. Some of them have six, eight brief therapy sessions. Uh, some of them have a lot of, we have consultation with teachers or uh, you know, family or GP or CAMS or whatever is the appropriate agency that might be able to offer something. Um, and you can see the distribution across the age groups and that the, the most that we're getting are that sort of 16 to 18 which, by the way, is where the system is most stuck, you know, that we have child and adult, adult but with very few services for 16 to 18 year olds. And this is across 10 counties. Um, uh, interestingly, we're getting almost, not 50-50, but quite a strong representation of young males, and we always wondered would that happen, or would the boys stay away? Um, uh, uh, this is, um, people can refer themselves, uh, so this is, you can walk in. Um, and so parents bring young people, young people themselves hear about it, um, and they come because their friends tell them this is okay, uh, or GPs, and there's a whole lot of other people. I'm just giving you the top three. Um, why do young people come to Jigsaw? I think these are a list of problems, and again, we've looked at you know, over 10,000, and this is the sort of <laughs> breakdown of the problems that happen. Um, and... Uh, well, yeah, not quite 10,000 in this particular data set, but just you can see that, you know, uh, for young women, uh, you know, the, uh, feeling anxious is very, very important. Uh, for young men, feeling angry. Um, I think it's often interesting. Women uh, tend to um, feel very bad, but in a sense, they often imagine there's something wrong with them. Uh, males feel very angry or feel very bad and imagine there, there's something wrong with the world, you know. So one is... I suck versus the world sucks, and it's a different thing. Um, it's probably a kind of self-protective thing, um, and so on. These are the problems. Um, I think that when we've just, this is in 2013, we began to measure more clearly what are the levels of distress, and we used a clinical instrument called the CORE, and there's a, a young person version of it too. And we found that the people who are coming through the door have very significant levels of distress. It's not to say they're mentally ill, it's not saying that, but they're very acutely feeling distressed. This is, it goes up to 40, these are people who get over 30. Um, and as you can see, when you look it up, it's uh, pretty much uh, 80% are in the moderate to very severe. That's a lot of distress. We're not just getting people who are feeling mildly upset. Um, the slightly different issues come up in the age groups. 12 to 14, being bullied. Um, 21 to 25, low mood and anxiety, tension, worry. Um, uh, with men, it's uh, anger, behavioural problems, family problems, stress, low mood and alcohol use. You can almost see how things develop, can't you? You know, you start out feeling and you kind of, there's almost an inevitability. And the question is, can we break some of these trajectories? Um, I think one of the big things we found is that the stress that is within us and without words tends to break out in physical symptoms and repeated acts. Um, that there is something that... You know, what we can say or express, whether through music or dance or sport or talking, uh, we carry inside us and it does harm. And this is true for all of us. The problems you're not able to deal with, that you're pushing out, the energy gets trapped inside the wall that you've built and that energy works on your body and it works on your mind. And it's something we need all of us to not get trapped inside uh, spaces in our head. What happens in Jigsaw? Well, the first thing is there's a welcome. And I think that's very important. It's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. And you know yourselves, if you've had interactions with doctors, you know, 50% of the treatment happens in the waiting room. You know, just the way you're met and the way you are not met, you know, and the way they say Mary, you know, or, you know, is there a human touch? Uh, is there, you know, and these things are very important. So you walk in and you see the receptionist, this was in Tala, um, and... Uh, and you just get that kind of warm welcome. But also what happens is that people are listened to and they're heard. Um, they're, there's a sense that whatever they're feeling, they're allowed to feel it, even if those difficult feelings, and there's a sense we don't get upset. Uh, a sense of just gradually making sense and learning the skills to manage those feelings. So how does this do any good? Well, here's the thing. It does a lot of good. This is uh, pre and post. Now, if you look at the, the, the yellow is the, the, what I showed you a little while ago, all those levels of presenting symptoms and how severe. And then this is post. This is, you know, six sessions later. It's actually average 4.4 sessions later. What happens to the same people when you give them those scores? 
Look what happens. Okay? It goes back to the healthy end, the, 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 the red. Um, and very, very few are in the, in, in, in even in the, very, very few certainly are, are in the moderate to severe. They have some mild, but there's a big shift. Why am I saying this? Not to say that jigsaw is good, which by the way it is, but I think because more importantly, that if we get in at the right time with young people, we can make a difference. There can be a big relief. Um, it, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's not rocket science, but it, it, it can be life-changing. Um, we grew Jigsaw over, um, we only started in 2006, and we opened in 2000, well, I guess we started Headstrong formally in 2007. We opened our first Jigsaw in 2008, uh, too. And we've grown, and we're to where we have 10 sites. And, and there's a, an increasing demand, and a lot of that is that people like it, young people love it, and the data is there to support that it works, which is very important. Um, this is what we have up to date, 10,900, nearly at 11,000. It's grown faster in the last three months than any other time in, in the last eight years. Um, we've never had so many people coming, mainly self-referred. Um, people have said things qualitatively in, in the, in the follow-up data and just wrote down a couple of comments. A very warming environment, like it doesn't feel like you're going to a clinic. Um, feels comfortable, easy to talk, completely changed me as a person for the good. Um, it was friendly and open. I never felt like I was here because there was something wrong with me. You know, that's very easy. It's just something happening. This is one, though, I really loved, this quote. Um, it's an amazing place. Um, you can say anything. Nothing is shocking. You're allowed to feel whatever emotions you have. You're even allowed to want to kill yourself without being made feel guilty or judged. Jigsaw understands that sometimes things don't make sense, and that doesn't mean that it's your fault. Uh, taking, talking normally makes me feel vulnerable, but at Jigsaw, all I ever felt was respected. Jigsaw doesn't add, it doesn't want to tell you what to do, just to understand and help you in a way that you want. Okay? That's a really good beautiful, and I'm not saying that everybody who walks through the doors feels that good, but to be able to say that, even one, it gives you the hope that maybe there are others who feel that way. So in conclusion, uh, some take-home notes. Uh, I think young people need facilitating environments. I don't think any of them make it on their own. And adults who don't give up on them and who behave with consistency and reliability. You know, and reliably. Uh, to be available and present as an adult, you need to feed yourself. Okay, you know the old airplane thing, the oxygen mask, in the event of an emergency, it will drop down, put it on yourself first, and then try to put it on the kid. Um, I think with adolescence, that's very important. It's not selfish. Just take time. If, whether that means, you know, driving around the block listening to the Nolan CD, that's fine. It doesn't, you might know, do yoga, you might have heard of meditation, but you might have no interest in those things. It doesn't matter. But there has to be some way that you know you can feed yourself, Okay. And then I think that uh, whatever a young person is feeling, there is almost... I think if there's one intervention I would suggest that really works is that I would say to a young person, whatever you're feeling, there's a very good reason for feeling that. Um, let's figure out what that is. Rather than, oh my God, something wrong with you. Okay? There's a good reason. People don't just... Uh, most of the reasons are about their relationships with, with the world they're, they're part of, uh, that they have broken down in some way for them. Um, and young people who seek help enjoy better mental health. So there is something about, you know, that moment of choice that seems to activate within people their own potential for recovering. Um, so thank you. <laughs>